Let's see, today is August 16th, 2019, and it's Friday. We're going to do chapter 19, The Rate of Interest from Human Action. Okay, uh, section one, the phenomenon of interest. What is the definition of or originary interest? What is the definition of originary interest? I think it's, um, it's existent all the time, no matter what economy, even in an evenly rotating economy, because of man's innate desire for time preference to have something now versus later. An originary interest is that interest rate but that um, signifies the difference between how much you want an apple today versus a hundred years from now. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll just read quickly the section. Please do, yeah. Originary interest is not the price paid for the services of capital, which is the typical definition. The rental price of a capital good is due to its services. Interest is not really a price itself, but rather a ratio of prices, namely that of a present good compared to that of a future good. So that's pretty much what you just said. Yes. The, the diff but it's put better because it's uh, the difference in prices between a future good. So you can like mm -hmm. say, I will pay you one penny for an apple ten years from now, or a dollar for one today. Right. So, originary interest also explains the finite price of land. Yeah. Which makes sense. Like, cause, <clears throat> like you didn't have that, then like land could just produce like infinite amounts of corn. So it would, it would be worth infinite amounts. Yeah, but, you could never sell it for anything other than more land. Mm -hmm. With that point fascinated me. I went back and listened to it again because I was like, what? Why Why is land special that you can't sell it for finite price? What is that about? Mm -hmm. So like, uh, is that a question or is no, it just that something would, that stood that out would, to you as interesting? Yeah, that stood out interesting. I thought so too. Um, I've never owned land, just straight up land, but I guess mm -hmm. people do that. Yeah. And... What, what is the point about it? That you, you it couldn't have a price well, unless... Well, the, if there's no time preference, so theoretically that land could constantly produce goods. Like yeah. You could just constantly grow more and more corn on that land. Right. So if you think of like this, the whole price because you have this source of infinite output, then the price should be infinite. Right. But because you prefer output now versus later how does it get the price how is the price determined for for land whereas uh why is it not infinite because you only have infinite goods over an infinite amount of time okay so you pick a, a number of years you're like look this is going to have this much yield in about 10 years that's how much I expect to get from it, so I'll give you this price. Yeah, and that's based on their time preference of those goods. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Does the serv serviceableness of the factors of production explain why explain the interest earned by someone who invests in them? Why not? I'll read again. Does the serv serviceableness of the factors of production explain the interest earned by someone who invests in them. Why not? I'm sorry, I don't follow that question. It's Does great. it make sense to you? Not really. Here, you can try reading it. Does the serviceableness of the factors of production explain why interest earned by someone Oh, explain the interest earned by someone who invests in them. Why not? Okay, so it gives us a clue to the yeah. answer. The answer is no. Um, the serviceableness of the factors of production do not explain the interest earned by someone who invests in them because it's, it's not about... Um, how much more of a yield you can produce with it 
with the factors of production. It's about the time preference, about how much you want something now. Mm -hmm. I think that's the I think that's the answer. That um, if you were to have a really efficient factory, that's not a reason for me to charge you more interest on the capital. The the efficiency of it. Um, my desire to have the or your desire to have the, the capital today rather than tomorrow is what determines the, the rate of the interest. Okay. That makes sense. I, yeah, that, that's a hard question. Yeah, it is. I'm trying to think through it a little bit. Like, it does have an impact on whether or not I'm going to, to buy or to rent some capital. Like, how serviceable is it? Mm -hmm. Is it going to turn over a, a, a profit enough for me to pay the rate of interest? But that's not necessarily how the rate of interest is determined. Right. It's about time preference. How does originary interest manifest itself in the market economy? How does originary interest manifest itself in the market economy? Well, I think it exists for all things, right? There's, um, and it's, it's uh, across all, all levels, like for uh, it's not just for rent for houses mm -hmm. um, or for land or there's interest on anything that is I, I um, that is given today rather than tomorrow right let me see maybe there's some some other like more specific point. Oh, you, yeah, you were just reading that. Um, the same phenomenon of time preference determines the level of markup in both examples. It is not the case that the cash loan market sets or determines the rate of interest in other markets. So it's all about people's subjective time preferences. Not necessarily like, oh, well, the rate of interest for uh, bonds is 10% in 50 years, so, you know, this Apple computer that you're going to rent me is, uh, is this rate. It's mm -hmm. like, no, they're independent. Right. It's funny how just interest rates in general, I feel like it was a hard concept growing up in like this type of like economy and environment. Yeah. Where like, we, like interest rates are just set and like no one really has a concept of like what they are and what they mean. It's very strange. They're like, well, what's the rate of interest on this bank account? right now it's like zero yeah and like so it's com like there's generations of people with a completely warped understanding of interest rates and no concept of interest rates if I'm not crazy I think I recall having a bank account as a kid that had a rate of interest of like three percent mm -hmm. and you know that sounds really good right now yeah. for because I think that the best you can get is like 0.1% rate of interest like right on a bank yeah I only savings. ever got like 30 cents yeah it's a joke well I guess so what does that tell us that people prefer uh, money in the
well, I future. Think, yeah, well, I think it's they're artificially set. Hmm. Well, they're set by the Federal Reserve. So people just have a warped understanding of what they are. It's not re- the market isn't really coming to a rate of interest. So, but if this were the market interest rate, then it would mean that people prefer money in the future almost equally as they prefer mm-hmm. money today. Right. Which just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, there is a part where he, like, Mises did talk about like zero percent interest rates, and he's like, he basically said it's like unfathomable. He said it can't happen. We can't even imagine it. And now we have negative interest rates. <laughs> that's true. It's like your. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it's like your. There's, most of the bonds around the world like have negative interest rates. So and what does that mean, technically? So your marshmallow experiment, you would say to a kid, here, you can have a marshmallow now, or half of a marshmallow tomorrow. And they would be like, I gotta have the marshmallow now. Yeah, if they're rational. Yeah. They, were, they would be like... That would mean that you prefer... Less you have a negative time preference. Yeah, it, they prefer less consumption in the future. Wow. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Right. But it exists because these pension funds can only invest in, like, certain grade of investments, which are bonds. And then central banks. Okay. Great example. Thanks for helping me think through this uh, bizarro world of interest rates. Why would originary interest exist in a very primitive state of affairs? Ah, because of time preference. Mm-hmm. Hello, it's the same answer to all the questions, I think. <laughs> Unless I'm missing something, that there would be, in even no matter what economy, socialist or anything, people prefer things now to later, which is why they're willing to pay more for them now. And people who have a low time preference who can wait will get more of the thing later. Okay. That's it. So here's the second part of the question. Sure. Is the concept of originary interest still valid in a socialist commonwealth? Yes. What does scarcity imply with regard to the technology improvement of production, the production process? What, read that again. What does scarcity imply with regard to the technology? technological improvement of production processes. processes. That it can be made more efficient. Mm-hmm. If there's a scarcity, that implies that technology is not sufficient to produce the demand. Yeah, I agree with the, that. The supply demanded. What are the definitions of plain and capitalist saving? Oh, this was great. You want to answer this one? Yeah, sure. Plain saving is like stashing away to consume later. Right. And capitalist saving is stashing away to deploy the capital later in order to earn a return on that capital. Yeah, and I think you could even be return getting a return on capitalist savings at the time. Mm-hmm. Like, I would say capitalist saving is like putting money in a money market account and what's the first one called? Plain. Plain saving is just putting money in a savings account that earns zero interest. Yeah. Definitely. Which is fascinating to just have the concept of those two different things changed my like mind, the way my mind works. And I, I, I knew about these things, but it just yeah. putting a word to it solidified those ideas in my head. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't want to just be plain saving. Like Right, I feel like I never really had a concept of plain saving. Yeah, I, I do plain saving with uh, protein powder. I order more protein powder than I consume each oh, month right. okay. so that I have a stash of it that I'm slowly accumulating in case of an emergency. But then that's mm-hmm. not capitalist saving. Until that's just... you go to sell that excess protein powder. <laughs> yeah, in the emergency, <laughs> my house becomes a store and uh, people can eat. You know, jack up rates. What is the essential deficiency of the static system as Schumpster describes it? Schumpster? Hmm, what's that? 
what is the essential deficiency of the static system as Jumpeter describes it? And there's a comment. If one eliminates the capitalist role as receiver of interest, one replaces it by the capitalist role as a consumer of capital. My intuition says that if, um, if in an evenly rotating economy, there would be no um, interest to be had because there would be no savings or accumulation to rent out to people, no way to pay interest. We're just all like... Yeah, I think you're right. It doesn't say anything in the... Um, in summary about that part well I might be able to find this section about it in the book because the name is Schum Schumpeter right? Schumpeter yeah and it's part three? part, part two part two this is the essential deficiency of the static system as Schumpeter depicts it. It is not sufficient to assume that the capital equipment of such a system has been accumulated in the past. That it is now available to the extent of this previous accumulation and is henceforth unalterably maintained at this level. We must also assign in the frame of this imaginary system a role to the operation of forces which bring about such a maintenance. If one eliminates the capitalist's role as a receiver of interests, one replaces it by the capitalist's role as a consumer of capital. There is no longer any reason why the owner of capital goods should abstain from employing them for consumption. Yeah, so in an evenly rotating economy, I would not... Um, maintain in my capital equipment, I would just use them up. I would consume. Mm -hmm. Right. It's like uh, the end of days scenario that he talked about. Where it's like, if you think that it's the end of the world tomorrow, you're not gonna have a time preference of, at, at all for, t for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Presumably. I guess it still might exist a little bit. Right. But you would consume. Mm hmm Okay, so can interest be abolished by law? No. Can interest payments be abolished by law? Yes. So why do you say interest can uh, cannot be abolished by law? Um, because it's a naturally occurring phenomenon. It's mm -hmm. a... It's a phenomenon of people preferring things now to later. It's all, I guess the, that's what this chapter was really trying to hammer home. Yeah. And you can't make a law to make people prefer something, but you can make a law to make them not be allowed to do something. So mm -hmm. they can't make the interest payments, but they're always going to prefer... Um, the things now to later, probably. I mean, they're, they'll have a time preference. Right. That makes sense. So, you could you can always... That's why you can always bring down... The Fed can always bring down interest rates lower because people will always have that more preference for now. Mm. But if they... That'll increase people. I guess it's both sides, lending and borrowing. I'm thinking through. So, bring down interest rates will just encourage people to borrow more. Is right. That, that time, like, because they're like, I don't even have to pay anything for the future. Right. I can have this money now. And if they jack them up to really high prices, then people just won't borrow money. Like, yeah, they won't borrow money. That makes sense. Three, there's not even a question here, it's just a comment. Okay. The height of interest rates. Comment. G 
changes in the originary rate of interest and in the amount of savings are other things being equal to aspects of the same phenomenon. So changes in originary rate of interest and the amount of savings are basically the same thing. Yeah, because if you don't have very many, very much savings, then the rate of interest is going to be very high because it's like, hey, I need to, to make a lot mm -hmm. on this. But if you have a ton of excess, the rate of interest will be pretty low because they're like, eh, this is cheap to me. Right. Section four, originary interest in the changing economy. What was the British classical meaning of profit? What is the modern understanding? The British classical meaning of profit is... Wait a minute. I thought... So I've, I've just listened to this on the way over, but I think it's the... What I understand is the, is the modern definition of, like, your production minus... Um, like, your sales... What a, I gotta find a good answer. The British classical economists classified the excess of gross revenues over total money expenditures as profit. Modern economic theory decomposes the difference into implicit wages. For the entrepreneur, interest on the capital invested and true entrepreneurial profit or loss. If a woman invests $100,000 of her own money into machinery and tools and also devotes 80 hours of her time per week running her own business in order to earn a monthly excess of $1,000 in receipts over her outlays, she will certainly not view the business as profitable. Right, because she's devoting all of this time, and time into her $100,000 business and oh, is only earning a thousand dollars. Right. And the classical British definition, she would have a profit of a thousand dollars. But it doesn't account for Yeah, she will time. rightly take into account that she could sell her label labor to other employers and earn interest on her hundred thousand by investing it in other ventures in order to earn much more than a thousand dollars per month. Right. Okay. So my understanding of it was that the British definition of profit is like a by the books, like here's the numbers, the profit and loss, and here's the, you know, here's the profit, and, um, but that doesn't account for people's time, is her, that the, her time, she, what do they call the, it? the interest that she could get on 100,000. Right, yeah, the opportunity cost, mm -hmm. so to speak. Okay. The computation of interest. Why do the activities of the entrepreneurs tend toward the establishment of a union rate of originary interest? I think because there's a market for interest rates and they reach an equilibrium because if you're willing to loan um, Joe a thousand dollars at ten percent and I'm willing to lend Joe a thousand dollars at five percent um, He's going to take the, the 5% and then you're not going to make anything. So you're going to lower your interest rate to right. something more competitive. Yeah, the study guide uses uh, the wheat and grape industry. and Do tell. I'll just read it, actually. Entrepreneurs tend to eliminate differences in originary rate of interest implicit in the factors of production in different sectors. If the markup between wheat and a loaf of bread is higher than the markup between grapes and a bottle of wine, then investors will shift their funds out of wine production and divert them into bread production. This shift will immediately drive up the price of wheat and drive down the price of grapes, and will also perhaps, after a lag, drive down the price of bread and drive up the price of wine. This shift will thus shrink the difference in markup between the two sectors. Funds will continue to move until the rate of interest of return in bread production is the same as in wine production. Huh. 
I guess that didn't occur to me initially that so in two different industries mm -hmm. the originary rate of interest so is right because it's the same like you have a hundred thousand dollars and you have multiple sectors you're going to invest like so the investment's going to go towards the best sector to get the most interest. Right. But as that money goes in, it's going to become saturated, which is going to change the prices of everything. <laughs> and so then that's no longer the best investment. That's so beautiful. It's like how water like rolls down a hill or something. It's just like fills in all the cracks, goes here, it goes where it's needed. Yeah, exactly. So I guess the game of investing is to be, you know, the first one. Yeah, and then be, that goes into that opportunity, right? When it's still there's an imbalance. Mm hmm. Hmm. Okay, that's great. If a bond is issued with a contractually fixed rate of interest, what happens if conditions change during the life of the bond such that people now discount the future more heavily? Can you please repeat that? If a bond is issued with a contractually fixed rate of interest, what happens if conditions change during the life of the bond such that people now discount the future more heavily? If they discount the future more heavily, they will sell the bond. Yeah. So they'll be like, hey. So let's put a number. Okay, so I you get care. a bond at, let's just say, 5% over 10 years. Okay. So, it's a, so what would be the condition that people discount the future more heavily? Would the rate go up or down from 5%? Well, it's, con it's contractual, so presumably it won't change. But if I can get cheap oh, right. loans... Yeah. Like, if the interest rate goes to zero, then I'm going to be like, what's the point of even having this bond? It's not like I need more money in ten years. Well, I wouldn't be the other way around. Hmm. Right. Yeah, because you're like... So, interest... So... So, I would buy more of those bonds. And so, I'd be like, hey... Yeah. This, this is going to guarantee me a rate of return of 5%, and if money in the future isn't valued as much, that means the interest rate is, like, zero, so I can get a lot more return with this bond. Mm -hmm. Let me just uh, read this. Please thing. do, yeah. People necessarily value satisfaction less as they become more and more remote in the future. So, I value, so that's the same thing as saying, like, I value the satisfaction less of a party 70 years into the future versus one now. Yeah. Okay. However, there is no reason for the diminish, diminishment in value to proceed at a uniform rate However, there is no reason for the diminishment in value to proceed at a uniform rate into the future. That makes sense. Indeed, since every actor has a finite period of provisions, it is impossible for valuation to diminish in a uniform percentage per time period. Because this would mean that each actor places some value, however small, on satisfactions to occur in a billion, trillion, or more years in the future. Yeah, zero. Like Which is I ridiculous. Value zero of anything that happens a billion years from now. Right. That makes sense. And yeah, be, and it's it's funny because like time is relative. Like five minutes when you're third, like a five minute period when you're thirty, is a lot faster than a five minute period when you're a year old. Yes. Because like relativity. You've had, like, way more five-minute periods yeah, than a one-year-old. It's a smaller portion of your life. Right. So your subjective time, per like, time preference as it goes out is also relative. Yes. I think older people have an easier time waiting. 
Mm-hmm. My Aunt Ricky would show up to, like, concerts and um, performances for us, like, and, uh, like, you know, super early. She would, like, be there when it opened and just sit there. <laughs> be ready to go. And it's like, old people can just... It's not Waste time. <laughs> it is customary in the loan market to quote interest rates on a per annum basis. This is a merely convention, however. This is merely a convention, however, and does not indicate that people discount future time intervals in proportion to their remoteness. The sloped yield curve, i.e., the different annual rates of return on loans, of varying durations show that people do not discount in such an even pattern. Right. This makes sense. Um, yeah, there was a quote that stood out to me from the book. Nothing would justify the assumption that this discounting of satisfaction in remoter periods progresses continuously and evenly. If we were to assume this, we would imply that the period of provision is infinite. However, the mere fact that individuals differ in their provision for future needs, and that even to the most provident actor, provision beyond a definite period ap- appears super... superrogatory, forbids us to think of the period of provision as infinite. So like you said, a billion years, we don't care what happens. Well, that was tougher than I expected. Sometimes short chapters are deceiving. Yeah. It was short, but dense and I'm confusing. Pulling up the chart of the yield curve right now. The in yield the US curve? Market because for it, what? Uh, for bonds, because it's inverted right now. Really? Which means that um, the short-term interest on like the two-year note is higher than the interest on like the five-year note. And it just shows like... That doesn't make any sense to me. Well, so that's a negative time preference? That's like you make a greater rate of return buying a two-year note than you would buying a five-year note? Mm-hmm. There's, I'll, I'll get it when I go on my computer. I would, love to, I would love to see it. Um, is it, is it, is it accessible? I'll put it on the camera. Uh, no, no, but there's a really good, I, I can find it if I look around. There's a really good website, um, that you, well, you can drag it over time and see how the yield curve is, evolves mm. and how it's changing. Wow. And like, you can see when like the Federal Reserve has taken like drastic measures to either move it up or down. I would and love the to see that. It has on the economy. That's great. Okay, well, that was great. So we finished part four of wow. Human Action. Amazing. Chugging along. Yes, we're in part five now, and the next chapter is chapter 20 Interest, Credit Expansion, and the Trade Cycle. And this looks like it's. I don't know. Um. Pretty big one. Is it only a five part book? No, I think it's seven parts or something. Um, So that next chapter is, let's see, about 50 pages. And it's in several parts. Maybe there's a good... The study guide questions, there's about two pages worth. It seems like it's something we can accomplish in one week. In one week? Let's mm-hmm. aim for it. Let's try and do it in one week. And if we don't get through it all, then oh well. Yeah. But I like I like where we're at. We're making, yeah. it, making progress each week. It's only three pages of questions. We're going to finish this damn book. <laughs> I know. And then I'm going to have like... So much more time. <laughs> 50% more of an understanding of this book. I think I need to do it all over again. Like, after I finish reading this book, I feel like I need to read it cover to cover again, because yeah, the first one was just a 
first coat of paint, like, and now and then I'll, I'll put the like the rest into my brain. Right. <sighs> Definitely a lot. Yeah, but it's really beneficial. I, I see myself viewing the world a lot differently because of this. Yeah, seeing human action and decisions that people make. That yeah, and I really been into Atlas Shrugged. Oh and yeah, like, you plowing through that. Too. Did you finish that? No, I just got to part three. Um, 